We're going to be talking about survival as an artist in 2013. What, is the, what, is, what are a couple of points that you should have in the back of your mind as you're trying to make your art capable of being sustainable now? So, 15 minutes of survival. So, we start with the premise that everything you're doing as an artist may appear like play and enjoyable, but as my image tries to allude to, there's a lot of significance going on in what you're carrying forward with your work. And there are two aspects, two, two means in this image I want you to bear in mind. The first thing, both your life and your work are obviously valuable, but you'll notice for your life and your work to be carried out through a situation that could be ambivalent or difficult, you better be prepared. You better have some equipment on, and you better know what you're doing with that equipment in order to carry those things that are really important to you forward. So what I'm going to try and do in very few minutes here is try and make a metaphor, some minimum knowledge, some minimum capacity, some minimum equipment that you might want to bear in mind before you actually uh, continue to deal with it, you know, with the process of being an artist in a world that is both ambivalent or you know, at best agnostic to your efforts at times. So we're going to go very quickly through a couple of albums. I don't know if I'll get through all of them. Well, we're going to go through with the notion of an invoice. All of, all of you who are artists here are producing works. Those works you're going to be giving to other people at some point. For money, for less money, for more money, for whatever it is that you want to have for those works in some type of exchange or, or, uh, uh, or some type of uh, uh, compensation. As opposed to going into a, the world of contracts. Everybody hates contracts, sounds very legal, and it's very demanding. Let's just talk about the notion of, of always doing something on paper in the form of an invoice. Can be on a serviette, can be on any, in any form possible. You want to put a couple of things on that simple piece of paper that helps you as an artist moving forward, that gives you agency, gives you the equipment to carry your work forward, carry the things of value to you forward. So, if you put in an invoice that until you see the money, the title, the title to the work stays with you. That means you have the legal rights to it. It doesn't, even if you give the artwork over to somebody, but you retain title. You write that on your invoice. As, they, as it says, title the artworks remains the artist until the artist has received the full amount of the whatever. So you'll see the meme here is you've got those babies on that leash. They're not going anywhere until that money comes. Right. So they're not just lost to this time or running out into traffic. You've got your work on a leash until you're compensated or until you're such time as you decide that you've been adequately compensated and you can move forward. So an invoice, which is a contract, can be a simple piece of paper on which just the contingency, title to the artwork, passes after payment. That means that if that, if that is simply there and accompanies your artwork, it's still yours officially until you're compensated. It means it's very easy to get it back, comparatively speaking, otherwise. So what else can go on the invoice? You'll see the meme here is people are, you know, taking photographs of art, maybe using that for various purposes. Don't forget, we're entering a period where a significant amount of visual art will be consumed online, will be consumed in, in, in various electronic forms in the future. You produce a visual piece of art today, you, you give it away to somebody, put on the invoice, point out the fact that they can have the object, they can enjoy the object, but you enjoy the copyright. As, as I point out here, the copyright includes all the things related to making reproductions, adapting the work, assigning the rights to exploit the work, make the, make the work available by technological means. A serviette already with two phrases on it will facilitate the value of your work and, and your careers. Number three, at some point, if you, if, you, if you struggle long and hard enough, you're going to have a body of work. But interestingly enough, the first works you do, even though they may not mean much to you in the course of time, they will to people who want to understand your work. You may emotionally move on, but somebody, whether it's a gallerist, a curator, or someone else, will really, really want to know where your first works are or the first works of significance that you've made. Because they give context, they give history to your production. So, if you put uh, on your invoice, that, that, and the invoice should contain at least as much information about the buyer as possible, in order for their, your gallerist, a curator, a museum, anybody you're professionally dealing with later can find your work, right? 
and also that the person that you're giving the work to somehow is made aware of the fact that you may want to get that work back, want that loan back to you for some type of retrospective or some type of contextualization of your work. Remember, if all the work's gone and, and the people who care about your work, who care about what you're doing, can't bring the work back together, can't reconstruct your narrative, a lot of what you're doing is just what you're doing in the moment. And that may be fantastic, and that might work too. In a lot of cases, it's, it's not enough for people who want to support you and, and be behind you. So the question of including these terms uh, in an invoice, buyer agrees to make the artwork available upon reasonable request for exhibition at the artist studio and galleries and museums. OK, we're going to burn through this. Um, so meme here, right of first refusal. Work goes out. You're five years, 10 years later in your, in your artistic career. The point is. You may have representation at that point. You may have something like representation at that point. You don't want works that are meaningful to, you, to, to your body of work, maybe a number out there, just moving randomly in this space. This can be very, very disruptive to your gallerist's ability or your representation's ability to work well with your career, stabilize your career, give you a, 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 a footing under, uh, under you. So here we see, is the work going onto the main highway or is it going off the off-ramp, perhaps, to your current gallerist? So if you included a provision in your invoice, again, just a serviette with one line on it, before the artwork held by the buyer or any transfer, it doesn't have to be as technical as this, but before the artwork held by the buyer or any transfer of the buyer may be sold or otherwise transferred, the artist or his or his shall have the right of first refusal. What does that mean? That a person who has the work comes back to you and asks you, do you want to match the price I can get for this? Or, do you, or should it go on to the highway of commerce? So these are, these are, these are the four elements that if you just include them in, in any kind of, just any type of documentation which you need to do for your, for your own interests are very helpful to the people who want to help you. So let's burn through to the next biggest, hottest question of artists generally who like to do it for their lives, representation. How do you get representation? And I, will, and I won't go through the list because we can post on this later. The number one way to get representation in the gallery is to be recommended by an artist already at the dinner table. So unless you're going to galleries, familiarizing yourself with the people at the table, and you have legitimate and organic overlap with them, you are most likely not going to get representation. It's Again, if you look at where we have solo or group shows, it's at position three. That doesn't mean uh, that it's that one is maybe 40 or 50 percent of recommendations lead to representation. Number three doesn't mean just as many; it means significantly less. So, in this order is the order at which representation can be statistically understood to take place. So, it's really important not to confuse production of high quality work with the path to representation, if that is part of a sustainable career as an artist. You must understand how the world works in this way and respect it. It's not about just being a sycophant and just hanging around and being a pest. It really means finding community with people who are at the table already and seeing whether it's a good fit or developing that fit organically. So this is the notion of, of, of recruiting. So what don't we want to do? Don't send in blind, sub blind submissions. This is probably no, no, known to a lot of people. But there is nobody out there waiting to see stuff. If there's no connect created organically by hard work, nobody wants to see it typically. You know, don't have to walk into a gallery and ask for five minutes. Don't bring the portfolio to somebody else's opening. Don't ever approach a gallery at a, a gallerist at a fair. This is one of the, 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 the you know, deadly sins by definition. Um, don't interrupt gallerists while they're working, obviously, and don't harass people. If you, if you can't build up a relationship organically, don't try and impose yourself. So these are very quick and dirty. I mean, if you, like I say, if the last two slides are clear, first four slides have, have only to do with everybody here as an artist who is just giving their work away to people for money, compensation, transfer, whatever. If the next step is the career, the last two slides are critical. You understand what leads to representation, and you understand what will not definitely, as a rule, not lead to representation. So then, in seconds, the consignment relationship. When you, as an artist, give 
an artwork to a gallerist. That gallerist does not have title. We talked about title a second ago. In New York State, it's yours. And you lend it effectively to the gallerist for the purpose of sale. That means that you can sign it. The, the, the artwork itself is what's called trust property. And the profits from the sale of the artwork are trust property. That means they do not belong to the gallerist. They belong exclusively to you, without question, by law. And it is almost impossible by contract to change that. So whatever you're signing in terms of contracts or whatever there's the verbal agreements you may or may not make with a gallerist, bear in mind, the law is not terribly interested in that. It has imposed a very high standard on that relationship by law. And so you give your artwork up, does not belong to the gallery, does not belong to the gallerist, it belongs to you, you have title. If that person sells that artwork, that money, by law, has to go into a separate account for your benefit. It cannot be commingled with the gallerist's other monies. If, if it is commingled, it's a crime in New York. It's a misdemeanor, it's still a crime, as of a year ago or so. So, I will go, how much time have I got? Drew? Okay, I'm good, okay. So, the big F word in the art world that many of you will only never have heard of, fiduciary obligations. A gallerist is your fiduciary. That means the gallerist owes you a very high standard of care in terms of accounting to you and transparency. In the real world, this doesn't seem to be the case. The gallerists choose you, they, they may, you know, in the obscurity of the relationship, be making all kinds of decisions. Ultimately, by law, they are obligated to do what you instruct. Sounds counterintuitive, but that's the law. They are your agents. That's what the law says about that relationship. So if you get into a situation where you're in a conflict with a gallerist, I'm not saying that you should seek conflict or try and lord over the agency factor against them, but you have to get out of the notion that you have no recourse. You have significant recourse, and if you have the right vocabulary to articulate that, the law is on your side immensely. So typical things that these fiduciary duties mean to deal fairly and honestly, disclose all information, to, to make account of any profits and care and manage work that can sign uh, uh, artwork prudently. So this is the consignment relationship. You must distinguish as artists in a, in a, in a representation between consignment, which is a trust, the, the, your artwork is trust property to the gallerist, but you're also often in a, in a relationship of representation. That means that they, that here the meme is, you know, typical pop culture reference, uh, that the gallerist must sacrifice their best interests to, to serve your best interests. That is the law. That means that if a gallerist can be proved to be serving their interests over your interests, they are actually breaking the law. It's not going to help you in all instances because the law is not going to rush to save your ass. But you must be aware that the, that the gallerist as a professional has to have an understanding of these, of these standards of care for which the law will obligate them. So for example, in the case of the, the, the liability of the dealer as an agent or a gallerist as an agent, when the, when the gallerist is, has undertaken in some form to propel your career forward, to shape your career, to decide to career steps, to place you on the marketplace, that person is an agent of you. Just like when somebody represents you in any other matter, they're subject to very high standards of accounting and having your best interests. And all of that is capable of being looked at by a court or by the legal systems. Again, not the goal, but you just have to bear in mind that the de facto power relationship is not the legal power relationship. So the, the, the gallery has a fiduciary obligation to act exclusively in the artist's interest and must scrupulously give up all advantages beyond the contractual defined compensation for its services. You have to think about that's imposed by law. Almost impossible to contract out of. Now, this is my last slide, fortunately. The art fairs. I'll start my, my, uh, my, my whatever here. So this is a riot at the Apple store as the meme for you and the art fairs. Okay? The art fairs are a place, all of you have been typically to one in New York, it's a place where thousands and thousands of artworks, hundreds and hundreds to <laughs> countless artists are represented, and collectors from all over the world descend and buy the artworks to the extent that they're actually available at the art fair on the spot. 
The point is that a significant part of turnover for galleries, if not the majority of money earned by galleries, is earned at the art fairs. The gallery themselves are lost leaders to prop up the brand. So you have to bear in mind that unless you're thinking of what you are selling at the art fairs, whether you like it or not, you can't possibly be contributing as a rule to the, to, to the gallery's bottom line. So as much as the art fairs are a scourge, they are the economic savior of most of the galleries out there trying to lord their relationships over you. So bear that in mind and don't think that just because you're going to get a solo show in the gallery, that that's going to be your career. Your interest to the gallerist will depend now and moving forward on how much of your stuff is selling at the art fairs. That's it, questions.